usually des de artists or designers are not good in uh, engineering and engineers are usually not good in art but the successful designers are ones who can converge these both streams what does it take to be a successful designer okay I, I you know this kind of applies to just about every stream uh, be it industrial design be it graphic design be it any design of course i'm going to talk from the background of automotive design because that's been my experience and my passion so you got to have obsessive passion that's a prerequisite condition uh, you know you 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 we all claim to be passionate but are we 100% passionate that's a key word and uh, you have to be 100% passionate for you to really excel and and um, you know achieve whatever you want to achieve we all want to achieve uh, fame riches and all that you have to really be obsessively passionate for example if somebody comes to me or somebody approaches me with a cv of a bike and a car and a uh, you know a cell phone uh, i know he is not obsessively passionate before if he was ob obsessively passionate he would have only stuck in a very narrow path to the subject in my car in my case it was cars now what does uh, obsessive passion actually uh, you know germinate you know this is a very controversial slide and it 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 generates paranoia because you're obsessively passionate you're paranoid to lose it you know you love your craft to such an extent that you become paranoid every small instance or every small person down the stream becomes very very important because you're obsessively passionate you almost have your back to the wall uh, almost every single day of your life because you're always trying to push the boundaries and the envelope further and further <clears throat> you have to make a differentiation you have to excel uh, i think the key aspect of a designer is to dream into the future long term versus short term it, it's it's a it's a judgment call that you have to make to yourself on yourself the aspect is that if you really want your success or your craft that you love so much to be uh, enduring and lasting a long time you have to eschew short term gains most of us don't have the courage to do that for example uh, students like you 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 know you want to be graduated you you want to take up a job be settled down but if you are obsessively passionate then you will actually think for the long term and the edifice that you create is is so strong that nobody can dislodge you eponymous is of course something i discovered by accident i mean the company was named after me and i realized that the reason why i worked hard i worked 18 hours 19 hours a day was i named the company after me and of course i named it because that was the prevalent uh, uh, practice of all the leading design houses in the world where they were named eponymously after the founders but i realized that because it was named after me you didn't want to fail so you walk that extra mile every day of your life because there is a failure uh, there is a stigma attached to failure and you obviously don't want to fail so in in a way in fact i i guide many companies and i tell them create divisions and name it after the stars that you have because that's so important to create uh, a standout division or a standout company casting the net wide you know in in this world of hyper competition you got to ensure that because you are obsessively passionate about your craft you will you 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 have to ensure that every single day you have new business or you make progress and therefore you have to cast your net net wide after the initial success because remember all organizations are a beast and you have to keep feeding the beast and how can you feed the beast by getting into newer and newer areas i mean uh, people are quite amazed at some of our uh, 
portfolios for, you know, we've, we started with cars and we ended, ended up doing even aircrafts. And why did we do it? Not, that, not because I loved aircraft, but I had to ensure that I fed the beast and had to cast the net wide um, and all that stuff. So, you know, what, what has been the scene in automotive design in India and what's the scene going forward? Um, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, to most of you, you may not be aware of it because probably you were not born. Uh, 50s to 60s, actually, the Indian cust customer had a very good uh, situation in the market because there was no local manufacturing and um, there was a lot of choice available on imports. 60s to 85, you had stagnation, you had licensing. And we were in a very, um, you know, uh, parado paradoxical situation where uh, the automotive industry was one of the most, um, you know, licensed industry where no new licenses were granted. And there were severe penalties on capacity being utilized. For example, uh, if Hindustan Motors of, of Premier Automobiles then produced one car more than their licensed capacity, they were penalized. And the cars were, had a price control, so you had to declare uh, what price you are going to charge the customer. You had to file with the industry minister or the industry ministry. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of red tapism. There was a lot of interference. Those are the era, that was the era between 60s and 80s where actually we missed the bus in being, a, uh, in being uh, lock in step with the world as such. That was a time when Japan, Korea, and, and countries like that really made uh, great progress. Uh, you know, I'll give you a, 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 an anecdote. In 1964, um, the Nissan Motor Company was smaller than Hindustan Motors. Can you believe it? It's, a, it's a, of course, Fortune 500 giant now. I think that's why, they, I mean, that's how the government stifled us. 85 to 2010, was cronism. You had Maruti, of course, it was a favorite child of the government. It was protected. You had uh, uh, rules being framed uh, for, the, uh, for the company uh, where, you know, because it was 800 cc, uh, the excise cutoff points were changed up to 803 cc or 850 cc. So you had, uh, you know, a disincentive for other manufacturers to really invest. And of course, all these were reasons why the automotive design uh, field uh, didn't flourish or there was no really uh, opportunity for them to uh, really do any design work because it was uh, a closed economy in that sense. It's only in 2010 when the uh, automotive industry has been an unlicensed industry uh, and the government uh, governments have by then, by then have realized that it's a great employment generator. Uh, did they really focus on uh, supporting and encouraging the automotive industry? Um, as we talk today, um, you know, India is trying to uh, uh, occupy a position of uh, the uh, world uh, producer of small cars, sub four meter cars. And therefore you now see a uh, lot of India centric design centers being opened in India primarily to cater to Indian tastes and Indian needs, but also to uh, you know, uh, deliver uh, the Indian uh, benefits of uh, faster uh, pr engineering uh, throughputs and lower costs to their other global centers. So in effect, it's, it, as, as of now, it's a golden era for automotive design because we are just getting started, whereas the world has really become jaded, they have become saturated. Uh, India and China are the next Big frontiers, of course, China is way, way ahead of us. So how has the evolution of automotive design been? You know, automotive design per se, as I, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, is a, is a field that is from the creative side of the business. So you got to be an artist primarily to be an automotive design not an engineer, not a science guy. And, 
you know in in when the uh, the car industry kind of took hold in the unit largely in the united states in the early 1900s you had a situation where uh, there were many manufacturers who made the chassis and the engines and you would actually go go to uh, several coach builders and make the type of body you you desired and um, you know that that was well I into the early 20s and with the onset of world war 1 uh, and of course later world war 2 uh, the the whole um, uh, you know social social strata of the world uh, changed largely the western powers where labor became very expensive and they had to resort to mass manufacturing and thereby gave rise to the first metal bodies in 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 the late 1920s and uh, that afforded a great opportunity for uh, manufacturers to kind of organize the design uh, of uh, you know cars as i said before that it, you you went you bought a chassis you went to a coach builder and he created the kind of car that you wanted uh, so general motors was the pioneer in creating this art and craft department it was called the art and craft department and um, uh, their 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 role was to really create cars that were desirable that were manufacturable and that actually delivered on the profit per piece that they wanted and that's one of the reasons why general motors took a lead from ford uh, till mid 20s uh, ford was a leading maker of course uh, trail blazed by the ford model t henry ford was quite uh, a stubborn character where uh, you know he really did not change the model for long in fact there's a famous saying or uh, there was a famous adage uh, by the ford motor company where you could have it in any color as long it was as long as it, it was black so um you know uh, there on of course uh, the uh, huge uh, uh, manufacturing setups across the world Uh, almost all countries had to be motorized um, and um, the you know the worth of a nation is usually measured by the success or the maturity of or maturity of its automotive industry much like in india now where the government is uh, uh, focusing on creating a vibrant automotive industry because of the employment that it generates uh, you know of course the world caught up with the us uh, europe uh, japan um, uh, korea um uh, and of course uh, in the last 10 years china it's quite amazing to know that in 2001 india was just 20000 units behind china in annual production so we were at 650000 china was at 670000 today <coughs> uh, india is at 2.6 million and china is at 30 million see the kind of progress that china has made however going forward my prognosis and is my prognosis alone is that we are now entering a shared economy with the ubers of the world the airbnb uh, the olas and you know almost just about in every field um, the usage or the kilometers traveled uh, by a car every year since the last 3 years has been falling for the first time in 120 years and that's changing the way uh, people are going to um, you know uh, use cars or buy cars in fact uh, my own daughter who stays in bombay she has two cars one a swanky car for the weekend and one a, one one car for the daily commute and uh, her car daily, her daily commute car was in the garage for over two months for some collision work and she didn't even take the car back from the garage and i asked her why because i was paying 5000 rupees a day as penalty and she said i don't need it because i'm using uber so it's hitting home faster and harder than you've realized so essentially what's going to happen is that cars are increasingly going to be used for leisure and adventure and not for commuting i'm talking in the larger sense i'm not talking of course there are going to be exceptions india is going to be lag behind uh, this kind of scenario but it's going to catch up very fast with the trends prevalent in the west already we are seeing in the design schools of the world uh, whereas they would have um, 
200, 150 applications per seat. I mean, I, I, I studied in Arts Center. When I went there, I was shocked that I was amongst 200 applications per seat, which was far, far higher than what one would have expected in Harvard or John Hopkins for medicines. Because the young males are also, were so enamored of things automotive, they all wanted to become car designers. It's not the case now. So, you know, there's a sea change in the uh, way the young are behaving today. They don't see uh, automotive design per se as a good career option because of the shared economy. So the cars are going to be used increasingly for, for leisure and adventure. You will have a car, you will use it for the weekend, for your daily commute, either you will not commute or you will commute by increasingly good public transportation system. A key aspect of automotive design, we really can't design with a flourish, whatever we like to, we have to be constrained and reined in with what is going to be acceptable and, uh, you know, um, homologated. Demographics. Um, largely today, what you and I drive comes from how the cars are engineered uh, in the West, largely the United States, Europe, and Japan. Because remember, that's where the bulk of the investments have happened in the last 100 years. So they influence the, the way you're going to um, you know, drive or the way you're going to consume. But that's changing fast because I said on the one hand, uh, cars are increasingly in, uh, getting, uh, you know, not, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they are, people are traveling less and less. And the rise of India and China. Now, unlike any other country, you have chauffeurs in India and China, whereas almost all the cars that you, you, you have in India as well, as of today, are meant for the driver and the co-driver. Now, that's, that's going to have a huge influence because between India and China, of course, China is the world's largest market and the world's largest producer. My prognosis is that India will now have the same trajectory as China did in the last 10, 15 years with the sustained FDI inflows, you will have our automotive industry growing at 20, 30, 40 percentage points just so, so that we are at the same level of per capita consumption on cars like China or the uh, Southeast, in, uh, Southeast Asian countries. So you're going to have cars that are speci specially designed for countries like India and China and we are going to set the rules of the game and not the Western powers because while we are growing, they are uh, diminishing uh, year by year in their volumes. Uh, materials, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's some, something, uh, it, it's a, it's a fact, factor that I spoke in the previous slide. Today, uh, huge techno technological uh, advances are making it possible to create smaller volumes, uh, materials that are, uh, you know, more amenable to be produced, of course, which can meet those uh, safety requirements and other requirements. Uh, as I said, technology, I mean, for, for example, uh, you know, I don't know if most of you know, but we have uh, just launched uh, the developing world's first supercar. I think it's on display in the campus here. And it was possible because of the new technology. This kind of car would have costed us about 600 to 800 crores of investment, and we've done it under 200 crores because we've used different uh, philosophy uh, in the sense our upfront costs have been lower because we used newer processes and newer uh, materials. And as I said, the new, <coughs> new world order where China and India are going to dictate. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, uh, challenges, as I said, uh, ergonomics, India and China MPVs, crossovers. China, India, the basic markets. These markets demand more of MPVs than sedans. Uh, crossovers, again, because of the kind of uh, terrain that we are in, uh, we, we prefer crossovers because they're sprung high uh, and all those issues. Aesthetics, the, uh, you know, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. A car is always going to sell on the way it looks because all things are now uh, a given. Engineering, price, retention value, service are a given. You expect it 
to be uh, common across the board, across the brands. So aesthetics, uh, the key reason why, uh, why you and I would buy a car into the future. And what is aesthetics? It's all about proportions, proportions, proportions. Of course, increasingly, cars are, I mean, right, right from the last 30, 40 years, you would have noticed that cars uh, have gotten aggressive in the, look in the looks department, and they will continue to do so. Uh, macho, power of aggression, and new tech. I think that kind of sums up. Thank you.